All right, good afternoon, campers. Um, so we're gonna talk about SEO goes local. I'm gonna mention a few resources, URLs during my presentation, and so you're not having to scramble to write those down. I've got a resource list online with all of them. It's actually got a lot more resources there for local SEO. Um, it's at bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y slash SEO goes local. So it's a bit.ly link with the name of the program. Pretty easy to remember. I will have this up again at the end of the program in case you don't get it now. All right, so um, search engine optimization is basically just trying to get your website or your, a web page to rank better on Google. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, a lot of people have been doing this for many years. Uh, it's a bit complicated. Uh, the concept's straightforward, but uh, implementation's a bit complicated. But local SEO is a little different, and I think a good place to start with that is just to just talk about what local search is. And it's basically when somebody searches to find products or services in their area. So you could be looking for a gas grill or you know a kiddie pool. I guess summer's on my mind. Um, you could be looking for um, an attorney, a dentist, um, home builder, any sort of thing. So. Basically, when you're looking to find products or services around where you live or around where you happen to be. And it's hard to get good numbers on this, but the numbers I've seen suggest that about 20% of all search has local intent and that that goes up to about 50% on mobile. So this is a huge market we're talking about. It's one we cannot afford to ignore. So um, this is a standard search results page. This is for, uh, I don't know how much you can actually read of that, but that's okay. This is a um, for a broad search, Santa Rosa Attorneys, which is a you know, local search, it's got a city name in it. These are ads at the top through the Google AdWords program. Some organic links down here at the bottom, you may not be able to read those, but they are local, they, they reflect the local intent. They are about Santa Rosa Attorneys. And then there are more results uh, tied to the search here in the map pack. And this is a three pack now, it used to be a seven pack. It's now much harder to be on the front page of Google uh, on the map pack. We have less, less chances to be there now. But if you go down here and click more places, you'll be taken to Google Maps and you may see, depending upon the query, you may see page after page after page of these, 20 results per page. So that's just to show you how some of these things show up uh, on Google. But who benefits from local search? Um, I think this will help a number of folks in the audience or your clients or maybe both. Anyone with a brick and mortar location is one type of business that benefits from it. If you have a physical location where customers come to you, you have set hours, clearly you benefit from that. That could be a retail location, um, it could be a bank, it could be a uh, doctor's office, any number of things. Service area businesses also benefit from this. So you may go to a customer and provide services or you may provide services long distance and you know, typical things to think about are roofers and plumbers and electricians, but it also applies to you know, landscapers, even web designers and web developers and folks like me who do SEO consulting. And even if you are a home-based business and you don't want to publicize your address, it can still help. You can be on Google Maps without showing your address and I'm going to show you how to do that. Now I typically think of five components for local SEO. There's Google and some other ma major players, citations, which I'll define momentarily, links from somebody else's website to your website, reviews, and then things you can do on your own website. Now this is a little different from regular SEO that you might do for a blog or for an e-commerce company. Um, you'll see that most of these have to do with things that happen off of your site. So that's one place where this really differs from traditional website SEO. So I'm going to go through each of these. I'll kind of define them, give you some tips about how to strengthen your presence uh, through each of these, and then talk about ways you can tie your WordPress site into each one. So I'll start with Google. Your Google business listing is very important. You can search for your business name on Google and then you see here on the right side in what we call the knowledge panel or the knowledge graph, there's a link there, claim this business. So you can just click on that if Google already knows about your business. If not, if they don't know about it, if you search for it and it doesn't come up or if it's a brand new business you're setting up, you can go to google.com business and again these links are in the resource list. 
and you're going to see a screen like this. And I suggest you choose storefront if you're a uh, physical location, a brick and mortar location where people come to you, service area otherwise. Don't do a brand listing because those do not rank in local search results. As soon as you do this and claim your listing, you get a good deal of control over what shows up in the knowledge panel here on the right side when people are searching for your business. Uh, you can add photos, you can change the description of it if the hours are incorrect. There's a lot of things you can do. You can change the category or add an additional category. So you instantly get a lot of control over how your brand appears in uh, Google Business Listings and Google Listings. You also get a nice mobile presence because you'll instantly get this too with click to call, click for directions, click to go to the website, big buttons that'll help out for mobile. Now some things that you're going to have to do to do this is you're going to have to verify your ownership because Google doesn't want to give control of the listing to a competitor or something like that. This is typically done through either your primary business phone number or your street address. So they can either do an automated phone call to your business and either way you're going to get a pin code that you'll go and enter online um, or they will mail you one. If you're given the choice and they have an algorithm that will decide whether you're given both options or just one, uh, maybe based upon past history of business use of the address or phone number or something. but. If they give you a choice, do the phone uh, verification because that is immediate and then you'll get immediate control over it. Um, but again, that has to be done to the primary business phone number or the street address, not to a post office box, not to another phone number. And that way they make sure that it's something that the business owner is in control of and somebody else can't grab your listing and list it as permanently closed or something. You want to fill in your profile, add photos, uh, all the fields that they give you. Make sure you're adding plenty of information there. Choose an appropriate category. And I've got a list of all Google Business categories in that resource list online. Um, a pretty good number of businesses that I work with, five or maybe even 10%, have a category that's either just tangentially related to them or something that's not related at all. I don't know how they manage to do that, but it does happen. So this is very important in terms of what kind of search queries you turn up for. So you want to be sure you're choosing an appropriate category. Don't do keyword stuffing. There's no need to repeat your city name or your service. Um, in the business description, you will get dinged for that. I don't like to say the city name more than once or the service more than once, like, you know, East Side Plumbers, Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, I wouldn't want to repeat those things. You don't need to say plumbing supply, plumbing repair, emergency plumber service, things like that over and over again because Google will ding you for that and it will hurt your rankings. If you have multiple locations, like if you have a client that's got several restaurants around town, then they're going to have to have a separate listing for each location. Now, I said something about hiding your address, so here's how you do that. When you go in um, to add a listing, and if you're claiming an existing listing, it's going to look a little different, but when you go in to edit the address section, this will come up. There's a link down here that says, I don't even know if I can read that. Um, my business has service areas where I serve customers at their location. So if you are a service area business, and I'd say even if you don't tend to visit customers at their location, but you don't have people coming to you, let's say you're a web designer and you tend to work from home, uh, you check that box and then you're going to get another one that pops up that says, I serve customers at my business address. Now if you have a home office and you want people coming there, you have regular hours, by all means leave that checked. But if you want to hide your home address, uncheck that box that says, I serve customers at my business address. Google will not display your address in search results then. You can see here this is a very competitive search, Charlotte Plumbers, and the number one, two, and three sites there. There's no click for directions. There's no address shown. Clearly it does not hurt your ranking potential to do this. So I said Google, etc. cetera. Um, there are some other players to think about. You may recognize some of these folks. Um, they tend to, be, tend to be fairly important. And I just want to start with Apple because Apple's got uh, a new product out. This is at mapsconnect.apple.com. Again, this is on the resource list. And you can go there and you can list your business. And this is important because there are a lot of people who use these things called iPhones. Sometimes they lose them, but um, anyway, 
a lot of people are on these, they're searching for businesses and you want to be there. It's an audience you want to be in front of. Google's not the only game in town these days. Uh, mobile uh, has changed everything. Voice search has changed things a lot. So the one thing about Apple Maps though is that this is just for storefronts, uh, places with physical locations where people can come to you because it's mainly for directions. So they don't have a way for service area businesses to get listings on Apple yet. They may in the future. They're becoming more and more like a search engine. Facebook is also important. Uh, a lot of people spend a lot of time on Facebook and quite a few people, if they're searching for something, may not leave Facebook. They may go right there to the search bar and search for something. So it's important to have a Facebook place page for your business. Um, I've seen figures that say 24% of all local search happens on Facebook. I don't know that I believe that, but I bet the number's relatively high. And one tip on Facebook, when you have a listing as a local business, you can actually have three subcategories. And I see a lot of businesses that just have one. So if there's something, another category that's related to your business, uh, go in and add those additional categories. You can have three there and it will impact how often you come up in Facebook search results. Facebook is even showing up on the front page of Google for searches now. You can see the star ratings there and all. So it's, it's an important place to be. Now Bing, and you may think, okay, who, who uses Bing to, to search anymore? But um, you'd be surprised. Something that happened a couple of years ago is Bing swung a deal with Firefox to become the default search provider for Firefox. So when somebody goes and downloads Firefox now, unless they go in and manually change who the search engine is, it's going to be Bing. Um, they also have deals to be the search provider for um, AOL and Yahoo. All those search results are powered by Bing. This is, these are the most recent figures I could find. They're from a year ago, but I think they're still pretty accurate. So when you add it all up, Google, Google has about two-thirds of desktop search and Bing has one-third. So that's, that's a big audience. Now this is just desktop search. This doesn't have anything to do with mobile, so you can probably cut that number in half for total search, but still, it's an important place to be. So I'd encourage you to go to Bing Places for Business and claim your listing there and make sure they have accurate information about your business. Now on your website, what can you do to strengthen this tie between these different search engines? You want to have your name, address, and phone number in text on your website. Uh, you can have it in this you know, nice graphic header, your website name, your business name, your phone number and all, but it needs to be somewhere in text on the page. Um, I've seen sites where I can right click and look at view source and I can't find the address or phone number anywhere on the page. And if I can't see it in the code, Google can't see it either. So you want to be sure that's there. I think a local area code is a strong signal to Google that you're a local business and it's a strong signal to consumers as well. If you move from somewhere else and you want to hold on to your phone number, you can get a Google voice number for free and have it forward. Uh, so you can get a local phone number that way. You want to have the city, state, business name, and main service in the title tag. And you don't need to repeat some of these if they're already part of your business name. So if it's uh, Eastside Plumbers, you can say Eastside Plumbers Atlanta, Georgia. You don't need to say plumber again in the title tag. Title tags show up here, um, the, the browser tab. They also show up as the title in search results. And for this business, I would say they should probably have it say, Ballast Point Brewing Company, San Diego, California, and that way they work in the full business name, what type of business they are, and the city and state in there. Um, and it just helps Google figure things out better. You also want to have a location page with Google Map embedded. And you see this a lot uh, with the address there. They've got the Google Map there, but this isn't the best way to do it. You can also do it this way where you, it's actually tied to the business name and it shows your reviews and all on Google. To do this, you search for your business in Google and you can't do this till you have a Google business listing set up, but as soon as you do, you can do it. You go over here into the knowledge panel and click on the map pin, which takes you to Google Maps. Go to the menu icon in the upper left hand corner. Click on share or embed map and boom, you get code to just drop on your site. It's really easy to do and you end up with a map that has this. Now, this does a number of things. It does a really good job of 
tying together your Google business listing, Google Maps, and your website. And you know, again, we're just looking for ways to make things a lot clearer to Google about your business, and this does a good job of doing that. So the next component, and I'm going to go through these pretty fast, um, half an hour is not much time to talk about local SEO, but citations, I'm sure you've come across a lot of sites like this. Um, these are places that list your business name, address, and phone number. And they're kind of like directory sites, which doesn't work very well for SEO these days. You know, we used to have all these web directories and you could list your sites on all of them and it doesn't really help much anymore. For local SEO, it's critically important still. And um, I'll tell you why. Um, Google doesn't visit all these places in person. Uh, they've got algorithms that do everything. So they crawl the web and they, they crawl all these sites, uh, Yelp and Facebook and yellowpages.com and all these. And they look at that name, address, phone number, and they're looking for consistency in that. If you moved your business a few years ago and you've got all these listings out there, and you don't have to create these listings. They just kind of spontaneously appear. Um, but you've got an old address at half of them and your new address, your current address at half of them, you're probably not going to rank very well because Google doesn't want to take a chance of sending someone to a place that's no longer there, that's moved, has closed down, or something like that. So consistency of name, address, phone number across these listings is very important. Um, address and phone number, probably more so than name. People tweak their business name a lot. Minor variations don't matter. If you've got LLC appended to your business name in some places and not in others, that's okay. If you've got ST versus street in some locations, Google can parse all that. That's not an issue, but you want to be sure they have the right address and phone number there. You want to claim these listings, so you do it kind of like you did with Google. Um, at each site, they're going to have something different, but there's going to be a link that says, are you the owner or manage this listing or something like that. And you'll have to look around a little bit, but go to Yelp, go to yellowpages.com, search for your business, you'll find these. If you have an email address associated with your business domain, with your website domain, use that when you're claiming these listings. It gives these services a little more... Um, comfort that you are actually the business owner or have some kind of relation with the business. Fill them out thoroughly. Another thing that Google looks at is citation quality and even citation quantity. Um, quality is very important. Are you on some of these major citation sites, um, ones that are important to your niche or ones that nobody's ever heard of? But fill them out thoroughly because another thing about quality is how thorough these profiles are filled out. So if they let you add photos, add photos. If they let you um, include links to your social media profiles, you want to do that. There are informal citations as well. These others are kind of structured directories. But if you, uh, if you have a client that opened a restaurant, um, one of the local newspapers may pick that up and say something about it and list the business name, address, phone number. A local blogger may do that. These are great citations. They're more informal. It's not like a directory structure, but they're very helpful. In fact, local citations are critically important, uh, whether they're informal or formal citations. Apart from some of the major national sites, and I'd say yellowpages.com, Yelp, um, I'd even include Facebook in that, and others depending upon you know, what type of business you have, local listings are the most important. There, there are local directories out there that you can find that you can list your site on, but any kind of local listings, local website mentions you can get are great. And then niche listings uh, related to your business are the next most important. And then there's like these second and third and fourth tier national directories you've never heard of. Um, on your website, you want to have the name, address, phone number. And th this concept's so important in local SEO, we've got this abbreviation for it, uh, NAP. So you'll see this come up over and over again here in the presentation. It doesn't mean it's after lunch and it's time to take a nap. but. Um, <laughs> Name, address, phone number in text, and I would put it on every page of your website. It can be in the footer, it can be in the sidebar, but I would put it on every page on your site. Now, reviews are another thing that's very important. Um, these review stars really draw your eye. They can dramatically influence click-through rate. Consumers make a very quick decision based upon things like this. They, they see the rating, uh, they see the review stars, and you know, boom, they've clicked and they're off to you know, wherever. You really need to ask for these. You see these here, I, I don't know if you can read this, but the, the top one and the bottom one are attorneys. They've got 62 and 59 reviews. 
That doesn't happen by accident. If you're a restaurant, you may get that many reviews serendipitously, but not as an attorney. Um, they're asking their clients. They're asking all their clients or they're asking their best clients for reviews. I guarantee you, you don't get this many accidentally as an attorney. So you just got to figure out where to put it in your process. It depends upon your type of business, the business model, if you have follow-ups with your clients and customers, but bake it into your process. Ideally, you're asking everyone or trying to ask your best customers or something like that to review you. Um, five is the magic number and 10 is even better. So this guy in the middle has four reviews. Why are there no stars there? Once you get to five reviews, Google will show that average rating and show the star icons. I see a lot of businesses that I go to that have like four or five star reviews and I'm like, you got to go get that fifth review. You got to find somebody that will do it. Um, as soon as you get those stars here, if you've got a good rating, you will, it will dramatically influence the click through rate. I guarantee you that if he has a good rating and gets those star icons there, even with just five reviews, it's probably going to double his click through rate on this listing. Oh, and 10 is even better. Once you get to 10, the average rating seems to become something of a ranking factor. Negative reviews. Um, this is a complex subject and it scares off a lot of business owners. They don't want to deal with reviews. They want to you know, stick their head in the sand. Um, and I've got some good information on, on the site, um, the resource list about these, and I'd encourage you to read up on it more there. But I'd encourage you to embrace reviews and embrace even negative reviews. You need to respond to negative reviews, but never in the heat of the moment. You have to remember that the customer is always right, even if they are wrong. Um, but if you can respond and give them some context for what happened, exhibit some compassion, and tell them how you're going to correct things so that you can make it right for them or it doesn't happen to the next person, a lot of times those people will go back and they'll edit that review and they'll give you a higher rating. Sometimes they'll even become some of the strongest advocates out there for your business. So um, you can use negative reviews to really inform management decisions, to improve your processes, um, but reviews are vitally important. I hear them described as the new currency of the web. It's not just Google, there's Yelp, Facebook, and others, and a good way to see what review sites you should be focusing on is to search for your business name, search for your competitors, search for your categories and keywords, and see what review sites show up on the front page of Google. That'll tell you really quick which ones you need to be focusing on. On your website, um, I think it's nice to have a page with reviews or testimonials. It'll also help you rank if somebody uh, types in your business name and the word reviews, gets them to your site instead of somebody else's. There's a Google, Google Places Reviews plugin you can use that'll pull in your most recent reviews. There are widgets for TripAdvisor, Yelp, all sorts of these uh, review sites. So the next component is links, links from somebody else's site to yours. Now, links have always been important for SEO from the early days of Google. Um, it's something people have been working on for a long time. It, it's a ranking factor from Google. Um, and you can pursue these even though Google sometimes says don't do it. It's okay and it is still a very strong ranking factor. Um, it didn't used to be important for local SEO. Uh, a couple of years ago we could get your Google business listing up, make sure there weren't name, address, phone number, errors, and citations, and boom, you're on the front page of Google. You're in the seven pack. Well, now there's a three pack and links are more important these days. Um, Google unleashed the pigeon algorithm. You may have heard of uh, Penguin and Panda. Well, they did the pigeon local search algorithm in July of 2014, almost two years ago now, and it, it did a number of things. Um, one is we have a much smaller search radius now. So before, if you search for restaurants from here, you might have come up with the top restaurants in Atlanta. Now you're probably more likely to come up with the ones very close to your current location. Um, it meant smaller map packs, so we went from the seven pack to the three pack. And links became more important. Um, links to your website became more important for local search than they were in the past. Now, link building is something that we could talk about for a long time, but I just want to give you some, some broad, quick tips here. If you support nonprofits and charities, they can be a great source of links. Bloggers, you know, know your local bloggers. No bloggers in your niche. They can be a great source of links. 
Partners and suppliers, if you have uh, somebody that you send a lot of referrals to because it just doesn't work with your business model but people ask you about it, they may be willing to link to you. They're often a great source of links and they may be happy to do it just because you're sending them a lot of referrals and they want to keep you happy. Alumni profiles, sometimes you can link to your business from those. If they won't let you link to a commercial site, you can often link to a social media profile for your business. There are industry directories out there for anything you can think of, mechanics and architects and hair salons and all sorts of things. So um, those are a good source and those are citations too. Chamber of Commerce, Better Business Bureau, those typically will cost you a few hundred dollars, but they may be worth it to you. Meetup groups are, you know, this is an interesting one. Google sees Meetup as a very authoritative site and Meetup has local ties and it has oftentimes ties to your business niche. And I can't go into detail here, but on the resource list, I've got a couple links that you might want to check out. Um, you can sponsor a meetup group. Not all meetup groups want to have sponsors. Some don't. But uh, when they do, it can be really cheap or it can just be providing them a meeting place or something like that. And um, you can get a very authoritative link back to your site from this meetup group. Um, which can be very helpful in terms of rankings. So one of the things on the resource list actually has a specific query that you can use to find meetup groups that have no sponsors in your city. So take a look at that. Discounts. If you offer discounts for seniors, veterans, and students, there are websites that will list these. Um, you can contact them for a link. Sometimes you even can get a .gov or .edu link out of these, and those are very valuable links. You can sponsor events. I uh, came across a story recently about a chiropractor, kind of a sports fitness guy. He sponsors every running event in his town, you know, 1K, 2K, 5K, marathon, whatever. Guess who's the number one ranked chiropractor in his town? Um, it, can, it can work really well. Youth athletics, you know, if the local little league or uh, soccer league actually links out to sponsors, that's another place to, to look. On your website, Great content is really you know, what helps get you links. Um, WordPress started out as a blogging platform and blogging is a great way to, to get some links. As a matter of fact, and I don't want to go through all these stats, but you probably can't read this, but it says the average company that blogs generates 97% more inbound links. So if you want to double your links, um, get blogging. So speaking of things you can do on your own website, in addition to all the regular SEO stuff you'd be doing, making sure you got the, you know, the right keywords you're going after, good content. I'll repeat myself a couple times here because these are so important. City, state, business name, and main service in your title tag. Name, address, phone number in text on every page. I also like to see prominent contact information, a phone number, hi, um, on the page. By the way, I agree with Judy about not having sliders. They're horrible for conversion. Uh, clickable phone number when you're talking about mobile. Hours of operation is one of the main things that people go to websites for local businesses for, so have that there. Any kind of useful information you can put, I mean, you know the, the tricks of your trade, the secrets and all, you know, the things you might share at a cocktail party or something about your business, and you can put those on your website. You know what questions you get asked over and over and over again, and if people are asking you those things in person, uh, they're probably looking for them online too, so uh, it's a great thing to do for FAQs. Directions can be really helpful. Um, when Google started focusing with the pigeon algorithm um, on more hyper-local con What did I do? <laughs> okay, I'm okay, huh? Um, when, with the pigeon algorithm, Google started focusing more on hyper-local content. So actually having directions on your site that mention landmarks and street names and things like that can, can help. Um, mobile, so critically important. If you, uh, you need to have a mobile-optimized website, if it isn't, change themes. may not be that simple, but it's, it's, not, it's not that bad. Um, we're really in a mobile-first world now. Over half of all organic search happens on mobile at this point. By the way, check out your website speed. Uh, don't do uh, website speed just on your desktop. Uh, check it out on mobile too. You can do that through Google Analytics and just segment for mobile. But you may have a site that loads in two or three or four seconds and you may think that's not bad, but that may turn into eight or ten seconds on mobile. 
If 5% of your traffic's coming from mobile, that's not bad. If 70% of your traffic's coming from mobile, that's a real problem for you. If you search for your business name on mobile, you should see something like this, a, a link there that says mobile friendly or a label that says mobile friendly. Um, if you don't, then when people search for you on mobile, you may not be ranking as high as you are on desktop search. And this doesn't mean you have the perfect mobile site. It just means you passed a few basic tests. So coming back to blogging, um, blogging's great. Google likes sites that are deep, that are frequently updated, and you know, bloggers write. You know, it gives us fresh content. Uh, it's a great thing to do. It does get you external links. I cannot explain why, but no matter how narrow your niche, if you blog for a while, people are going to link back to you. I have no explanation for how it happens. It just, it just happens. Um, it gives you a way to latch onto stories in the news, kind of a soapbox to talk about those things. Uh, you know, your slant on it. If something happens in your industry that b becomes newsworthy, sometimes that can work for you and give you a lot of local press too. Business people know they need to be on social media, but they often don't know what to post there. So this is just another thing you can say, here's my latest blog post. Hyperlocal content can help these days. So, you know, when you're blogging, you don't have to just blog about your business. You can blog about things happening in your neighborhood and, and work in some of these neighborhood names and things. And it does seem to impact rankings a little bit. It may be a minor ranking factor, but it does seem to help. You know, you can talk about the mural across the street or your favorite place to walk the dog or, you know, the best park in your community or things of that sort, road construction. So that's a very, very quick look at the five components of local SEO. Um, this is where you can find me. By the way, on Twitter, I kind of have a little bit of a curatorial account. I don't post a lot there. I may be doing more right now because of WordCamp. But um, if something important comes up in the world of SEO or local SEO, I try to post it there. And usually that's just you know a time or two a week. Things do change pretty fast in SEO and local SEO. Um, there's the link again, bit.ly slash SEO goes local, and there's lots of resources there. Um, so I think I'm ready for questions now. Yes? Uh, yeah, the, the question is, how does that mobile-friendly label come up in search results? Yep, that's from Google. Um, they run it through a little algorithm and see if it's mobile-friendly. Uh, there's actually a testing tool for mobile at Google, and the link for that's in the resource list as well, so you can check it out. They'll also give you a lot of suggestions that may actually improve speed on your site on mobile, so that's helpful too. Yes? multiple locations do that? Yeah, um, we didn't have time to get into all that, but um, how do multiple locations deal with the name, address, phone number, and text on every page, and the, the city, state, and the title tag? Location pages, basically an individual page on the website for each location is probably one of the best ways to do that. If you have two or three locations, sometimes you can just do all that on the home page. Home page tends to have more page authority in Google's eyes, so if you can do that on the home page, it can actually help you rank a little better. Um, but if you have 20 or 30 locations, you can't, you can't do that. You're going to have to have a location page for each one. Um, you can have a separate location page for each one and still have all that on the home page. If you only have two or three locations, that would be fine. But I would have it in the menu. I'd have all those locations in the menu if you can. I mean, unless you're national and you have 200 locations. Yes. You know, th this area is so specialized. Uh, SEO is becoming very specialized now. You can specialize just in AdWords and analytics. And I just use Google AdWords Keyword Planner for that. Um, it's the main tool I use. I'm a one-man shop, so I don't have every tool out there. Um, yeah. Yes? You should always use the name that the public knows you by. Does that help? Okay. Yeah, uh, yes. For... I have so many questions, but I'll leave it. <laughs> uh, how would you enable someone to respond to your blogs without attracting spam? Is there a way to do that? We've got all of our you know, responses turned off because they're all 
Yeah, I, I like um, having blog comments. I, I don't have any proof for this, but I think it gives a signal to Google that there's actually some interaction and stuff going on there on the site. You do. Um, I had a blog. I was a professional blogger for many years, and I, you know, I, I would go through and deal with spam comments. But you know, Akismet's great, and um, it works really well. So that'll get rid of most of them. Yeah. All right. Yes, behind you. Yeah, there are a number of tools like that. Um, there's Moz, M-O-Z, Moz.com. There's a number of them out there. So I tend to use them because they've got a nice local SEO tool too. Yes? I do use Schema. Um, and it's a way to have some machine-readable markup on your site to give Google a little more information about your business. And that's kind of a, a deep subject, but a um, couple of points. Anything in schema should reflect what's on the page. Otherwise, it's almost like hidden text, and Google doesn't like that. So um, your schema markup may need to vary per page, or you know, for location pages, it may need to be a little different. I tend to use JSON-LD instead of schema within the HTML now, because it, I just find it works better and doesn't mess up the HTML. And yeah. Yes? Oh. No, that's great. Go on. Um, probably so. I don't think they're gonna they're gonna see that. Um, right, right. Yeah, I, not as far as I know. I've never come across that being an issue. I would say don't ever use a forwarding address on these citation sites in your Google business listing uh, in terms of your website. So if you changed your website domain years ago and you got a 301 redirected, change it to the current domain in your Google business listing because that will that will hurt you doing that. So uh, there was a question back there in the teal. Uh, um, if you uh, generally map pack rankings are tied very closely to organic, so unless you're ranking well organically, you will not rank there. Um, age of your Google Business listing, unfortunately, is a factor. I see places that rank very well; they don't even they don't have any reviews, they don't have a website, but their Google Business listing has been there for like 10 years or something. So, uh, but organic factors, anything that would boost you organically is probably going to boost you in the map pack too. There's, um, I think it's on my resource list. If not, yeah, it should be there. Local ranking factors, you can look at that and it actually lists the top 50 factors in order from all these local SEO gurus around the country, uh, you know, their opinion of it anyway, the most important factors for the map pack. So take a look at that because that's, that's helpful too. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of moving parts in local SEO. Uh, I think it's on moz.com actually, but just, just look on the resource list for local search ranking factors or just Google local search ranking factors and I think you'll come across it pretty quickly. Um, how are we doing on time? Okay, great. Uh, yes? Yeah, um, the, the JSON for schema markup is, um, I just typically do it in a text file and then just drop it in there. Um, some themes or plugins will have a place where it allow you to add any script to the header so you can do it there. Or if you're going to vary it by page on the site, you can actually just drop it into the, the WordPress, into the post or the page. Um, it's just within script tags. There are a lot of examples out there online. Google has some examples about how to do JSON. It looks complicated at first. It is, I'm not a coder. This is Java, JavaScript object notation for linked data. And I'm not a coder and I can do this. I don't know anything besides HTML. I'm really dangerous with CSS. Um, so, you know, if, if I could do it, probably most of you can do it too. You just need to spend a little time getting used to it. Um, not that hard. Yeah. Again, where is your resource? This it's at bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y slash SEO goes local. And that's actually, it's just a shortened link to, to my website, to a local SEO resource page on my site. And I keep that updated pretty quickly because I'm doing presentations every few months and I, I try to go back in and make sure I've got current information on there then.
slides you put on Slack? On Slack? I don't know. <laughs> you tell me. Uh, the slides are on SlideShare uh, now, and they will be, um, I think, I don't know if uh, WordCamp Atlanta is going to share all those. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, any other questions now? Yes. Uh, uh, can you get a Google business listing for an organization that just meets in a church? Yes. Right. Um, you can try. Google knows that there are, I mean, if you want to, you can definitely do it if you want to use a home address, but if the leadership of the organization may change, you probably don't want to do that. Um, Google knows that there are businesses that exist at the same address, uh, like you know businesses in a mall or something like that. So you should be able to use the same address as the church. Um, you'd want to have a separate phone number. That would be helpful. But if it's a if it's not a closely related category, if it wasn't a religious oriented charity or something like that, then you have a better chance of getting them to approve it. Okay. Uh, the questions about location of a web server, I don't believe that impacts things anymore. Uh, it doesn't matter where your server is. Google's used to that. They know people use servers all over the world. Back in the back. Yeah, no. It's hard. Um, <laughs> a better tactic would probably be to pick some specific markets in the state that you want to hit. And I'd pick the, the best one, either the biggest opportunity or the one you think it might be easiest to rank for and create a landing page for that city. And then it's just like plugging in a lot of unique content. Uh, I don't know what kind of business it is, but if it was a construction type business, you know, photos of jobs you've done there, videos. Um, your favorite places in that city, it can be a lot of things, but just lots of unique content. Keep going at it until that page ranks and you see what works, and then you can start doing it for other cities too. Um, there's probably some things in the resource list on local landing pages. If not, look up local landing pages, local SEO, something like that, and you'll find a lot of people talking about that. Yeah. Okay, we have time for about one more question. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, the, the question was when, when you get links from other sites, does Google differentiate based upon what page uh, that link comes from? Is there a different value? Yeah, home pages, uh, the, the home page typically ranks better, has more page authority, but it's not that great to get site wide links either, where basically it's coming from the footer or sidebar. Um, you know, if you can get just one link on the home page, it's great, but if they're putting it in the footer or sidebar and then it shows up on thousands of their, of their pages, I don't know if that's very good either. Um, I don't know if that helps that much, but I'll be in the happiness bar. We can talk about that one in more detail if you want. Mr. Collins, I'd like to thank you very much for this talk. You'll be in the happiness bar. Yes, I will.